Ja, schönen guten Abend, meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren. Ich möchte Sie ganz herzlich begrüßen im Namen des DFF, Deutsches Filminstitut und Filmmuseum, zu der heutigen Veranstaltung, dem Artist Talk und dem Screening of Blue Orchid von 2017 von Johann Grimond Press. Und ähm, er ist schon bei uns, ähm, zwar nicht physisch, leider, er konnte leider nicht ähm, selber hier anwesend sein ähm, und ich werde jetzt auch auf Englisch ähm, weitersprechen. Um, we will have him online here on the big screen and a very warm welcome to Johann Grimon Press. Okay, but first of all, I want um, to um, say some warm thank you to Anita Beckers, who made this evening possible. Um, for a long time, we had been talking about um, that we would like to invite Johan here to the film museum and have a talk, but it was always postponed and postponed. So now we said, okay, now is the time, and Anita made um, the exhibition, which will start um, tomorrow at her gallery. And um, then we'll be seen there um, until the um, 28th of um, November. Um, the exhibition show is um, called Every Day Words Disappear, which is also a film title of Johann. And we will show this short film also tonight here. Um, and I want to um, welcome Philipp Ziegler, who will make the talk. He's from the um, ZKM in Karlsruhe, is curator there. And yes, we are happy to have you here. So I won't talk too much. Um, Johann will make, a, uh, sorry, um, Philip will make a short introduction of Johann and then we will follow the talk. Um, the talk will be about um, three quarters of an hour and um, we will have the two short films. We will show um, them in between and um, afterwards we will show the Blue Orchid and then there will be still the possibility to ask questions. Okay, so have a nice evening. So, ich begrüße Sie ähm, sehr herzlich zu unserem heutigen ähm, Filmabend mit dem belgischen Künstler und Filmemacher Joan Cremont Press. Ähm, vielen Dank, Natascha, für die Einleitung. Ähm, auch ich äh, werde jetzt auf Englisch äh, switchen. Äh, Joan versteht Deutsch, aber wir haben gesagt, wir machen die äh, Präsentation heute auf Englisch. So, um, my name is Philipp Ziegler, as you heard and I'm working at the ZKM where we wanted to have a next year a larger exhibition uh, with uh, Johan. We are also at the moment preparing a new work uh, with him. Due to Corona, unfortunately, we had to postpone the exhibition project um, to 2022, but uh, kind of it's so exciting to work with um, Johan together and when also um, you, Anita, asked me to, to do the talk, it was, was of course very um, one second. So. Diese Sitzung wird aufgenommen. Sorry for the interruption, John. We had just switched on the the recording. Mm -hmm. So I was just telling that we unfortunately had to postpone um, your big show uh, at in the ZKM to 2021, but uh, 2022. But we are really looking forward um, to work with you on your new exciting project. We are also later on talking about uh, in this evening. Um, Anita just uh, pointed out to me last uh, that last Saturday on in the Guardian, um, the English newspaper, the Guardian, Barbara London, which is one of the most uh, esteemed curators in the field of uh, new media, um, opened up a new um, category, and she, uh, it's kind of a series about the 20 most revolutionary um, works of video video art from the. Um, 1960, when the video art was um, first, uh, well, invented with, the, with the, the technique of video uh, up to today. And one of the 20 most important video works is also a work um, by Joan Grimmon Press. I'm saying this just um, to say again that um, Joan is, of course, one of the most um, well-regarded uh, video artists, and we are very happy to, to talk with him um, tonight, even if you are not here in Frankfurt, but um, in Greece, um, where, it's, uh, where you have a house and you are sometimes living. So um, you 
are um, a Belgium original artist, but uh, you work very internationally. You live in New York, uh, you live in Greece, you live in Belgium, you t uh, you're teaching um, also in in um, in the United uh, in the United States in New York. Um, the the possibility to to teach online, of course, gave you now um, the, also the possibility to stay in your um, calm house in 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 Greece and to prepare um, your next exhibitions. Even if you wanted to be here, and we also we this was an important we um, scheduled an important meeting also for our uh, show uh, during the opening of um, Anita's exhibition but well we are doing it now uh, via zoom as so many other uh, projects the conversation today will take maybe 45 minutes um, in addition to the to the film blue orchid uh, which is the main film we are showing today we also decided to uh, include two other um, shorter films um, an interview film, an interview with Michael Hart, um, the philosopher who, um, together with Tony Negri, published um, the very influential books Empire and uh, Multitude, as well um, as another uh, film with a, a British uh, neuro neurologist, Raymond Tallis, on um, tickling. The two films, the smaller films, they are also connected with Blue Orchard and they are all coming from a um, documentary um, you made 2000, it was released 2016, um, Shadow World, on an inside full documentation about um, the arm trades, the global arm trades, also based on a um, book with the same title uh, by the investigative journalist and former politician um, Andrew Feinstein. Well, I mean, I hope very much that the um, connection, the Zoom connection stays stable. And after um, the screening of Blue Orchids, we will have also the possibility um, for, in, for a Q&A and um, to, to talk with um, or to direct uh, questions to, uh, from the audience to um, Joanne. I mean, um, Joanne Grimman Press, Many of you, you know him already. I think there is also a kind of a, um, some really fans and followers of your works in the in the audience. But I just want to say, I mean, when you largely became um, or you appeared in the art scene, it was probably the Documenta 10 with your work, uh, Dial History, a complex film collage in which the history of airplane hijacking is linked with the history of media, the history of television. In the installation at the Documenta, uh, the audience um, was able to tap itself through an extensive archive material um, of the work. Everyone in, in this installation uh, became a curator. Um, even you could um, add your own films to the, to the installation. Um, the Documenta 10 was in 1997. Uh, this means kind of um, before 9-11. Uh, dial history really opened up um, a lot of um, our eyes also on that what was happening in the um, from 2001 and um, on the on the war uh, on terror it showed us the relationship between media and terrorists by doing so it unwrapped um, the hidden dimensions of our mediasized um, culture the cultivation of fear and catastrophe Truth and falsehood, um, reality and fiction cannot be separate uh, in the world, but also not separate in your work, and uh, they merge into the uh, into another. Um, media manipulation is maybe the question which follows uh, through um, your whole um, so body of work. Um, the question how far CNN, which was of course in the 90s uh, a new thing, um, borrows from Hollywood and vice versa. And um, this may be kind of the topic of the media manipulation. This is maybe also why his work uh, remains so much um, relevant also in our uh, times, the times of um, a huge skepticism towards media, towards the news, um, and uh, with an advent of a lot of uh, conspiracy theories. In works um, like maybe um, the sky is really green and we are just um, colorblind, 
Um, Grim and Press deals also with, as a media archaeologist, with the connection of commercial, the commercial break uh, and zapping, the history of television and the technical development of the remote control. In his work, um, Double, also um, from 2009, he combined doubles of Alfred Hitchcock with the doubling effects of the Cold War of this, and the space race, cinema and television, capitalism and communism. Um, Joan once said that each technology um, invents its own catastrophe. The ship invented um, the shipwreck, the plane, the plane crash. Virilio, um, and um, this uh, Joan referred to Virilio, uh, uh, Virilio um, um, meant with this quote the television and, with his, and uh, that the television turned the world into an accident. Um, the times, as we know, of television and of maybe also of cinema um, uh, are gone. Streaming platforms and social networks um, and social media are the new media channels. So, I mean, you are not here today and um, this is caused by the virus. But what do you think this catastrophe of the virus, um, Joan, is this the, well, is it the, the following of the globalization and digitization? Is this why we are now here on a distance? Did you think Ooh. about this current situation as you are following the catastrophes of the uh, 20th century so far? These are big questions. Huh? Uh, well, I would, I would uh, think about COVID as sort of symptomatic of something was wrong in our time. The way we are separated from our reality or the world or you know, big, um, let me backtrack a little bit. Yeah. Because you mentioned Paul Virilio uh, alluding to the fact that every technology invented its own catastrophe, but also maybe with the advent of virtual reality, the reality is accidented, says Virilio. Yeah. So we have a whole different dimension to reality as well, which I think is interesting to explore. Karl Rover, who was the advisor to Bush Jr., one said, you know, we're an empire now, we make our own reality. And so this is, of course, related to truth, it's mm. related to how we deal with one another, uh, how, we confine, how we actually define rea reality in relation to community, in relation to how we actually interact with one another. So all these, these are big themes. So COVID is, is inevitably part of that as, as, a, as a symptom of how we actually have compartmentalized so much mm. of what we are about you know everything has been measured in quanta in what is profitable into you know economic values but we forget that actually not that not everything is about economic values or mm. profit you know it's also about community and and maybe COVID is a sign of of you know of a wake-up sign of of you know what what yeah. makes us question what's wrong with the world and our connection to the world I mean, now lately in the during the lockdown in um, March, Peter Weibel, the artist, media theorist, and also CEO of the um, uh, of the ZKM, he reminded on a theory he was already kind of um, working on in the in the nineties, but at that time nobody um, was interested um, in. It's kind of the society of the of proximity and uh, the tele society. And he reminded again that during the last uh, hundred years, I mean, from the late nineteenth century, all the communication technologies like television or in, in the 19th century, of course, uh, telegraphy, then the telephone, television, telefax, and also the internet uh, were primarily um, uh, technologies to overcome distances to, and he's, uh, I quote him, to separate uh, the message um, from the body of the messenger. And um, of course, now we are, we are living in a, in a uh, infosphere, kind of, we are, um, uh, we all know that uh, kind of 
yeah, this communication via digital means is uh, this what we have to do now also, and um, all those uh, those warnings um, do not touch. I mean, they are very much connected also to the to the digital possibilities. But um, somehow, I mean, we haven't still um, kind of fully recognized that we are um, or the abilities of the tele societies because we and, and we are also gathering uh, here in a cinema. We are still um, kind of um, uh, as humans, we are connected to this, um, to the to the society of proximity. We like to gather, we like to meet, um, and um, all this. What is now so dangerous in a way? But what do you think? I mean, um, and this, I'm just. We wanted to start with the first um, with the first film, uh, Ryman Tallis on tickling you made in 2017. And tickling, it's probably one of the closest and most intimate things you can do. It's kind of defines us, as you said, uh, or as in the film is said also as humans. Um, what ma made you so interested in, in tickling already in 2017 when kind of proximity was not a problem? Okay. Uh, I, I'd like to backtrack a little bit because you were talking about television and, and the, this whole tele, yeah. this, this far away yeah. uh, distance. Um, like Double Take is a work that definitely deals with that, with the fact that when television came about, it also included that that control, the ideology of a society could be controlled from afar. So the television made actually the move to the suburbs possible. And it's it's sort of in, in relation to the technology of the car, but also the, the, the whole re mm -hmm. reorganizing around the suburbs and the privatization of the couple, the happy couple, the the the, the, mon the the sort of the nuclear family was sort of the the ideal consumer unit that was propagated as a, as a as a move to the suburb with a car with a fridge with a television, but that control to the suburbs was possible through television, and so it's not that you know with with that with the reinvention of this the, away from proximity to tell tell to, to actually connection on a distance doesn't mean that that ideology is being broken on the contrary it's it exerts its control even more or th there's another way of how that control is exerted and so while we were happy consumers happy consumers of of domestic bliss nowadays we're consumers of fear and so it's a whole 880 degrees that we've been drilled you know film the, the film was sort of that history of the illusion of going going about and taken off into the world of dreams. But with the television, we actually take off or actually crash with the airplane. We have an airplane crash. We actually go into the realm of the catastrophe. It's a catastrophe culture that has been beamed into the households. But now it's even more exacerb exacerbated. We yeah. actually can wear the technology. We, 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 this, this, this whole like sort of far away distance, there's a contradiction between intimacy and what has been propagated with things that have become so intimate as part of our body, mm -hmm. if we have an iPhone, and that control through imagery and media is so close to us, it has become very intimate, that actually at the cost of something else. So that privatization is, is still part of the process. Mm -hmm. To come back to tickling, because maybe you want to show the first film, but, but indeed, when we interviewed Raymond Tallis, professor of medicine in Manchester, which was actually for Shadow World, the film about the mm -hmm. arms trade, was indeed to, to actually put that in the section of diplomacy. Because we've been drilled into the whole culture of fear and that's been sort of abused and exploited by, by the war industry to dictate a certain foreign policy. Definitely in the United States, because yeah. the United States, actually the defense industry is half of, of, of what actually has been uh, reeled and dealed worldwide is half by the United States. And so when we talk defense industry, the United States has a big impact, but also that defines very much foreign policy. But we wanted to actually find an alternative in the film by opening up that culture of fear to something else. And interviewing uh, Raymond Tallis, I thought maybe it's interesting to reconsider how we actually stand in the world. And, and the way you would define sort of um, even big words like consciousness is that those things are actually relational. The way we define ourselves, the way we define our subjectivity, individualism, 
uh, and our private selves are actually always relational. And then he, we, the point of departure was, of course, the question, why can't we not tickle ourselves? Because you need the other to tickle yourself. So it's the ontology of the other that you need the other to actually get tickled. And so that relation is actually a point of departure, which we, which I think, you know, it's at the crux of what we're talking about, COVID, technology, yeah. but maybe we can watch it and then okay. take it from there. Yes. Please show us the first film. Um, Raymond Tallis on Tickling from 2017. It's an eight minute uh, long film. I mean, maybe you can just tell us a little bit how this dialogue um, with Raymond Tallis, um, what was the occasion of, of, of the dialogue? I mean, it seemed like that you had kind of a very casual um, meeting there with also a lot of um, fun. But then there came those very heavy, well, statements and uh, just remind this, um, we dialogue, um, therefore we are. I mean... Mm -hmm. Could you describe a little bit how is how do you do the interviews and how long was it and um, why didn't you use the material for your main documentary? Okay, well, it was initially in the film, but you know, a film about the arms trade, and then we're going to watch another yeah. film, uh, Every Day Was Disappear with Michael Hart, which is for a, a little section in the film talking about love. But that also, that was cut out for a big part of the film. But the, the thing about tickling was cut out completely. And, um, well, you know, a film about the arms trade <laughs> and tickling was very far apart. Uh, but not to me. We had a four-hour cut of the film, but we had to reduce it to 90 minutes. So inevitably, a couple of things mm -hmm. were, were cut out. But I so much like the interview, and there were actually a couple of interesting things said that I thought were so close to the way we could redefine how we relate to the world and relate to one another, that it was so important to get this still out there in the world. And uh, it was actually co-production with the Flemish television who invited me for a seven minute thing. And then I thought, mm -hmm. what do I still have? What is, what is useful? And then they helped me produce it and, and we, we re-edited the full version. But the beginning section on tickling was initially also in the bigger, mm -hmm. in the bigger mm -hmm. film. I mean, um, you once said um, a statement which comes very close to this. Um, we need to learn a new alphabet, an alphabet, alphabet to describe togetherness. Uh, I think this is, uh, you said, in relation to a new project, but it would kind of uh, very much also refer to this, what we have uh, seen. And in another interview, you said um, what we actually need is not a so-called new world order, but rather a new world community. Um, could you explore a little bit about what you mean with um, a new community and what do you think about this, uh, the comments? I mean, we will also um, show in a few minutes the film with um, Michael Hart, and this will be also um, one of his main topics. But this is a theme you're kind of, since a long time, you're, you're investigating. Exactly. So, yeah, it's been a while that I got uh, sort of stumbled into the theme of the commons. But come and community it means actually together. So it's about togetherness and how we relate to one another. So Raymond Talas is already relating to that. But I think it's so crucial to rethink that, that in a sense, uh, Shadow World started off how privatization, even the privatization of war, has defined a world where fear has become so dominant. But fear, which makes also that we live in as isolated individuals. But it's not only, it's for me, it has to do also with not only the privatization of what's going on with our tax money, but the privatization of our imagination. You know, um, we all feel so disconnected to politics, uh, in a sense. When I, when I have a younger audience and I'm teaching, I feel like there is the sense of talking about politics is so far removed of of. of of the, that connection to sort of having a holder, being able to make a change, except for maybe voting, but having a change that people get really upset about, you know, what's going on with the climate, with the world, et cetera, et cetera. And that we forgot that actually politics is, 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 is a part of how one can change the world. But as with Blue August, Blue August starts with Chris Hedges saying, you know, mm -hmm. maybe there's been a corporate coup d'etat. 
in the sense that actually the corporations have such a huge hold on politics these days. You know, there's three defense lobbyists for every politician in Washington. And I think what what's at stake to me is how can we rethink that relationship in the way, because politics is very much about the, the, the sort of negotiation between the individual and the collective, right? And I think we, we miss that too. We have lost that too. And uh, you, you know, we're going to see everyday words disappear. A big part of, of the way the film is being edited is the intersplicing between Michael Hart and a film by Jean-Luc Godard called Alphaville. Mm -hmm. And in Alphaville, Godard is sort of imagining a world where everything about love and about uh, tenderness and about connection to people is being sort of castigated as something that is forbidden in society at, at the threat of actually being banned or being, you know, killed. And I sometimes think that we live almost in a world where we have forgotten how we can connect to one another. Definitely now with the world of COVID, there's so much huge control that is being exerted over us. That fear has become so dominant and we less think about how we can connect to one another. And so indeed, uh, like what Michael Hart says, you know, maybe we, sh we have to come up with a new alphabet. We have to come up with new terms, how we redefine the way we relate to one another. Raymond Tala says that, you know, maybe the way we stand in the world as individuals is maybe relational. The way mm -hmm. we define the world and the way we use language, because he, he compares it to language, that language is something which is shared and it's a way to express ourselves. But it's by way of learning that language from your mother or your dad or from being in society that you express yourself through something that is a common. And so Michael Hart and Antonio Negri would also in their book Multitude define the common, they, they use the word common, other people use the word commons to make a distinction between the historical definition of mm -hmm. common to, to the way it's defined today. And they would define the commons as, as language, as something we share, but still how we can make sense of our own individuality. It doesn't mean that you lose your individuality. It has nothing to do with communism, where the individual is subjugated to a state apparatchik. It has nothing to do with that. Commons is much older, you know, 12th century. The common charter of the forest in the 12th mm. century was already part of, of, of common law, but also the Codex Justinianis uh, had in itself four categories. The rest communis was also part of the, of the, of the Codex. So it has nothing to do with communism, although come together is part of that. Um, but I think we have to sort of redefine the way we share things. And we have lost a lot of that. A lot of of what was the commons is actually being privatized as well. I mean, in your know, in your new work, um, you're also looking um, beyond the human. I mean, you are looking to termites. Could you tell us a little bit um, your shift to termites uh, in the in your new film, The Soul of the White End? Right, which is a book by Jean Marais. Mm. But it relates also to the work of Lynn Margulis. Mm. And uh, she wrote a book, Symbiotic Planet, based on her research and a sort of um, a, 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 crit a critique on Darwin, Charles Darwin, mm -hmm. that maybe he wasn't telling the whole picture. And uh, she came to the conclusion through termites. There was the, the Darwinensis was a, a termite living in, in Australia, where there is a protozoa living in the guts of a termite. This protozoa is actually a microorganism, a microorganism that consists of many microorganisms. And this protozoa, called Mixotricha paradoxa, many-haired, mm -hmm. sort of a paradox of many-haired uh, creatures living together, mm -hmm. have comprised of a DNA, which is only half of what that DNA could be able to use to survive, which is only part of the picture, which the other half would be the termites' DNA. So they're actually intertwined in a way where they would not be able to survive without one another. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, there's also within genetics, there's, there's a new movement which is called metagenetics. It's the genetics of communities that actually most creatures, most living organisms, including us, will live with more microbes than cells. Mm -hmm. So we in the cells are a biotope. And, and from the work from Lynn Margulis, through her work with termites, uh, and through the idea of symbiosis, which is, um, in a sense, uh, the way she, she sort of postulates that through symbiogenesis, that evolutionary theory could be sort of reconceived 
through forced cooperation, like small organisms eat other organisms, mm -hmm. and because they don't I digest, they are forced to, to live together. It doesn't mean that they're mutual beneficial, only they survive only because they're mutual beneficial. It could also be very violent, it could be aggressive, and they cannibalize one another. But because of indigestions, they don't digest, they're forced to live together. And so a cooperation becomes a big part, symbiosis becomes a big part of how Shivi conceives the way the way sort of uh, maybe life is constructed. She was laughed at in the 80s. She was laughed at the 80s and 90s. She was very much laughed at and not taken serious until DNA has proven her right. So the mitochondria that are inside cells have very, and everybody's sort of body as well, the mitochondria have, have it seems, have different DNA than actually the cell itself. Mm -hmm. And so she was proven right that actually we are cells as well. We actually survive thanks to symbiosis, thanks to cooperation with actually more microorganisms. We wouldn't be able to digest our food without the microbes mm. in our gut. And so when it comes back, to come back to COVID, maybe COVID is, is sort of maybe a sign where we have to, I think it's not the enemy. I don't think COVID is the enemy. Mm. I think it's something we should embrace. I think Sweden is maybe an example where you know we co-evolve and our dna co-evolves by actually including dna of other species amongst microbes amongst diseases we think that microbes are the enemy but actually in a sense they're actually also our benefit and so mm -hmm. covered it maybe not the enemy maybe it's a way of rethinking the way you know it's it's anyway we're getting into another <laughs> therapy but maybe i'm expanding too much but you know, the, the 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 whole mm -hmm. Exercise on termites is very much this exercise, you know, rethinking the way we stand in the world together. Maybe we should see now the next film, um, Everyday Words Disappear by Michael, or the interview with Michael Hart, the philosopher on the politics of love. Um, made in 2016, it's a 15, milli a 15 minute film. So we are back there, John. Um, the film just finished. Do you hear us? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. I had to unmute. Well, it's, I think always when I see this film, I mean, it's very striking how Michael Hart and um, the Godard's Alpha film are cut together and are fused together. Maybe you can <clears throat> tell us a little bit about your the use of montage. I mean, we have seen it also in the Raymond Tellis um, film. You mixed um, the interview with kind of short um, footage, uh, found footage, and we will see it also in the Blue Orchid um, film where you use a certain kind of material. What is, um, what is your, I mean, how do you do it? And is it associational or is it um, kind of based on a, um, on a strategy? Uh, well, it's a storytelling device, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, But I, I first have to mention that I was uh, now seeing it again. I'm surprised how much it relates to COVID as well. Mm. You know, this whole society that is deprived of touching one another, that everything about tenderness and connecting to one another is, is refused in this whole COVID society. And isn't it remarkable that this whole um, control of fear to the war of terror has disappeared and has been mm. replaced by this domestication of fear to the control of the body? It's either a microorganism that lives in us, or it's skin, right? Mm -hmm. It's racism, or it's uh, it's the COVID. And and I'm surprised that that control of fear, where Michael Hart talks about global apartheid, but it's also it's a new apartheid, not mm -hmm. through politics, but an apartheid through the control of a state apparatus on on the domestication of our bodies. So anyway, I wanted to mention that mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, because it's so contemporary, it's so related to what's going on today. Uh, but then I'd like to mention Mahmoud Darvish, who's a Palestinian poet. He says, you know, poetry chooses the side of love. And I think the storytelling, um, I think when, when you mentioned uh, referring to an interview that we have to invent a new alphabet, which is actually a quote by mm -hmm. uh, Eugène Marais in uh, The Soul mm -hmm. of the White Ant that indeed, you know, maybe we can't understand termites unless we reinvent the way we can understand them through a multi-species or an interspecies sort of uh, understanding. 
uh, trying to build that to build that bridge. But the storytelling is maybe a way to do that. Like um, ultimately, in Alphaville, in the film by Godard, it's actually the alpha computer that is controlling this society where everybody's being sort of in their global apartheid and sort of relegated to their own individual, not be able to actually express their love, is ruled by a computer. But the protagonist is going to come into that society and sabotage the computer by way of a poem. It's a Borges poem that will sabotage that computer. So again, it's a poem. It's the poetry that all can overcome. You know, poetry okay. also can contain contradictions. And maybe it's, it's the way one can reimagine the way we connect to the world, to reimagine that relationship that I think for me, splicing, for example, Alpha with Michael Hart opens up what's being said in another way mm -hmm. to reimagine what, what that could be. Um, but also, um, Anna Karin, Karani, Karina says as, as well, you know, so many words have disappeared. And then she talks about tenderness and autumn light and you name it. But in times of COVID, it's very similar. You know, there's a deprivation mm -hmm. of of connectedness that that if Michael Hart says on a political level we have to reimagine what democracy means it's being totally atrophied mm. by the privatization of the war industry or the words like you know freedom works like um, you know the way we stand in the world together but you wanted to talk you want me to talk more about the language as well eh? but yeah about the way films are being constructed well, but maybe, yeah, you can tell us a little bit more about the process of how you work. I mean, it's clear that you are kind of, you're a researcher. I mean, you research a lot of topics. You go kind of in, in politics, you go into philosophy, but also in, in literature. I mean, these are, they are all very much kind of in your, in, present in your, your work. Um, you're also, let's say, a slow worker as there is a years on um, archival work first and uh, looking in different uh, source materials. Um, is there kind of, how do you, if you're approaching a new um, topic, how do you think about creating a new work? I mean, often it's also not clear what comes out. Well, it's, it's slow because maybe it also digs deep, deeper through layers. It's, mm -hmm. it's tries to look for juxtaposition and, and try to confront uh, different worlds. Like, for example, building a documentary, you would, would play very much on questioning very much the language of documentary, which in a sense, even like politics, is infused with fictions, it's infused with constructions. From the very first inception, documentary theory knows that Flaherty was already you know, fictionalizing the story mm -hmm. of Nana Kof, the North in the first documentary film where the fight against nature is being set up as a construction. Mm -hmm. And based on an igloo that was too small, they had to rebuild a set, which was a bigger igloo that would fit the tripod. Mm -hmm. And then the wives of Nanook were actually the mistresses of the filmmaker. So even the storyteller seeps into what, what sort of the protagonist in that film is. But it's the same with if if one, you know, for me, making a documentary is at the same time also making transparent how that construction happens. Now with Tao history and double take, yeah. for example, uh, there's also that tension between fiction and fact and fiction, because I, I, I was working with novelists, with fiction writers, where a juxtaposition of a historical timeline, archival, which is at the same time historical, but political, but also uh, relating to, you know, the world as, a, as, as large, but then being confronted with a fiction story underneath mm -hmm. can make juxtapositions that opens up, not necessarily meaning that actually then reality is being fictionalized. It's like, you know, weapons of mass destruction within politics. There's so many fictions that seep into politics as well. You know, there's a, maybe there's a reason why we don't connect anymore because there's a lot of fabrications in the media that we don't connect anymore. So fictions also proliferate in, in politics. Yeah. And for me, trying to explore, you know, how one can work with those contradictions, as Picasso said that, you know, uh, art is maybe a lie that tells the truth, that those contradictions are interesting to explore. And so for me, uh, maybe it's slow, the process, 
but maybe it's deeper in the way it sort of explores all those layers. And it's the way we stand in reality. You know, we're all contradictory creatures. We're living oxymorons. <laughs> you know, we're... we're <laughs> um, well, there's also a saying by the um, New York uh, Critical Art Ensemble, and you are um, you put uh, their text on documentary uh, on your website, and there um, they say, well, uh, film is not now or nor it had uh, never ever been a technology of truth. It lies at a speed of 24 frames a second, which is probably. Um, kind of um, very sharp uh, saying what you are wrapping up what you what you are saying that it's never um, you can never touch the truth also with a documentary but how would you say uh, I mean with your with your different works from dial history to to now your new works I mean uh, was there a change in working with or looking for truth in documentary Yeah, that's the crux of the question. You know, you can never touch through. Uh, is that a true statement yeah. or it's not a true statement? Yeah. So there's a contradiction and you can never touch. It's the Nietzschean paradox, right? So there, there's nothing as such thing as a truth, but is that a true statement? If it's a true statement, yeah. then it's, it's, it's like post-truth. Is there something beyond truth? Is that a true statement? Then it's not useful. But if it's wrong, then it's, it's like also an oxymoron. We, we can't use it. It's not a valid yeah. statement. So... There's, that there's no such thing as truth is maybe not a true, thing, not a true statement. <laughs> so it's that's, that statement doesn't make sense for me. Well, but it's actually to come back to yeah. what the evolution is towards now, is that indeed our history in double take is very much about media manipulation, but to unmask something means that you're actually moving towards something closer to the truth. Maybe truth is also like language and like consciousness may be relational uh it's it's like tickling you know it's it's mm. it's because you tickle me i know you exist that that's a truth it's an ontology of the other of otherness that may be true is also relational in this context but you know while the history and double take was very much a work with fiction writers shadow world and blue orchids as well which we're going to see mm. or everyday words disappear even if there's a section of alphaville which is a fictionalized world It's not so far from reality and the truth. And so it's a juxtaposition with a political philosopher with a fiction film, but still it sort of points at something beyond that. Um, I Maybe, you know, Harry Frankfurt, uh, a philosopher, wrote a little book on bullshit. <laughs> and so he was talking about politicians and how our language has been eroded. But he followed up the little book with a new, a new little pamphlet which is called on truth and he was defending truth and he was defending truth very much through uh spinoza and the idea of joy and uh the, the feeling of joy because he would argue uh through through this pamphlet by you know if i say i love you and it's you don't believe in a true statement that that i can actually make a relationship of course we sometimes say i love you and we mean oh maybe I'd like to meet my mistress next day or whatever you, of course, in a film, you can imagine that that may be like in a Hitchcock film, somebody says, I love you. And in the back, she, they have a knife, you zoom out and then there's a knife behind the back. But still, if you don't believe in the basis of I love you, then you can't have a society. And so that, that's by Harry Frankfurt's sort of, um, sort of pamphlet. Yeah. Eh? And I would be very much with him that he actually defends truth in a post-truth world. Yeah. And so the, the movement of Shadow World is very much, since it was not a work with a fiction writer, but it was a work where it was a, a sort of a collaboration with a journalist, a politician turned journalist. And so the journalistic etiquette was very important, yeah. to maybe unmask where reality has sort of been hiding in, in fictions and manipulations to actually point at the truth and try to unmask that. And so instead, it, it, This, the, the etiquette of journalistic sort of endeavors was very much important in Shadow World to unmask that. So we had to cut things yeah. out that actually were alluding to a lie and we had to cut that out. But that leads us to Blue Orchid because Blue Orchid came about because of a lie that was yeah. present in the editing of Shadow World. <laughs> actually, yes. I mean, it's a truth that it's very much a scandal that um, there is still around one 1.6 trillion dollars uh, which are spent on weapon each year and um, 
kind of this is probably money which misses or which the states can't uh, give to education to their um, fighting of starvation and um, to the health system but kind of the um, this shadowish world of um, of the armed trade um, nowadays i mean it's very much in the background i mean nobody's talking anymore on the climate crisis on um, starvation and um, all the other problems i mean covid it's of course the uh, the main topic uh, of the world, but maybe uh, even more important also to remind uh, those scandals and um, which are there still in, in politics and also in, in business, where in shadow world um, there is one saying, well, uh, I mean, it is that it is, uh, some are rich and some are dead. I mean, that's how the world uh, works. And in um, Blue Orchids, um, you are interviewing two kind of specific persons, very charismatic persons. I mean, one is uh, Chris Hatch, a former correspondent of the uh, um, New York Times and an expert uh, on the Middle East. And the other one is um, Richard, uh, or Ricardo uh, Privitera, a former arm dealer, kind of a very opaque um, man, and you don't know really what, what he's talking about, but he's also talking very clearly and very openly about how the arms deal is uh, is working. I mean, um, did you, I mean, you are very much working also with kind of with these dualisms, but uh, in the in the end, I mean, both of these main characters of Blue Orchids, they, they seem to be traumatized by war and um, warfare. Right, we have on the other, on the one hand, Chris Hedges, who lost his job because he was exposing the lie of weapons of mass destruction. And on the other hand, we have Ricardo Privetera, the weapons dealer, by way of manipulating fear, is actually making his money. And so they're diametrically opposed, but actually at the very end of the film, they come very close together because they're suffering from the same trauma, the war trauma, uh, what that wo wo world of war does to, to us. You know, and indeed, I would say the arms trade is the big elephant in the room that nobody talks about. Mm. Because a lot of uh, the taxes that are needed for, for actually rebuilding our world, to think about the climate, reforestation, you, know, you name it, starvation, all of that is being stolen by the weapons industry to buy weapons to, for what? You know, maybe they have the wrong enemy. <laughs> you know, it's not fear. Mm. Now it's replaced, of course, by another fear. But... But I think it's the big elephant in the room. And if we want to really tackle climate and tackle, you know, pollution, uh, starvation, et cetera, et cetera, we have to first think, you know, what's happening to our, our common, because the taxes are common money, mm -hmm. it's completely been siphoned off for a big part to, to the defense industry. Like, uh, I think it's two years ago, 9 billion in, of Belgian taxes. They say, oh, we don't have money for this. We don't have money for that. The healthcare education, indeed, et cetera, et cetera. They've cut, there's budget cuts everywhere. But then they, they have a 9 billion to spend on weapons. And I think that doesn't add up. And of course, if you look at the system, it's very much the corporate lobby, which is sort of a legalized bribing, a legalized bribing that has a hold over what's going on with the taxes. And so our connection also, again, our relation to politics has been completely uh, been sold out by a corporate lobby. And the lobby even is writing the legislation, even on a European level, when we think about Brussels, they're more lobbyists in Brussels than politicians. And it's the same system. It's the same for Big Agra. It's the same for uh, the banking industry is very similar the way it works. And even more money is different off. Uh, but also big tech, you know, the way our, uh, the building blocks, the very building blocks of life are being privatized. Our DNA is being privatized uh, for big profit at the cost of our health. And so this is a huge, uh, yeah, I think it's a huge uh, topic that should be on the table. I think uh, we often with uh, Andrew Feinstein, which was the collaborator on the project, we often uh, sort of say that maybe every weapon dealer or maybe the big not the weapon dealers because they're the in-between person but every defense company they call them defense company but maybe they're war companies you know there's 10 big ones you know lockheed on top mm -hmm. 
maybe they should be uh, sued for not genocide, for killing people, but for ecocide, because they're actually stealing the money that is needed to build the world or, or to arrange the climate, etc., and drag them in front of uh, the International Court of The Hague. But that would be very difficult because America didn't ratify the, the International Court of The Hague. They even have the, the Hague Invasion Act, mm -hmm. where if somebody would stand trial for a genocide committed by the US Army, they would invade the Hague mm -hmm. and free the one who would stand <laughs> trial and, and, and save them from the clutches of, of uh, the evil law system. So that's how far we are well when we also, mm -hmm. you know, we can't hold international multinational com companies accountable because this is another thing. You know, it's also on a multinational level, on a, on a world level, not on a national level. Well, this well, is a long discussion, of course. It's a long discussion, and um, Chris Hatch and Ricardo Privitera will tell us more about it. Um, now please play um, Blue Orchids from 2017. It's 48 minutes long. <laughs> 